Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Money Thoughts, the show that helps you think about, better understand, and have more power over your money. I'm your host, Deborah Frazier. As many of you know, I'm a wealth management advisor with LRG Wealth Advisors. That's the name of my team. And we're located at the firm of Hightower. And I am very happy today to welcome our first guest from Hightower, Mr. Stephen P. Ban. Stephen, welcome to Money Thoughts. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Good. I'm glad you're here. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a wealth management advisor with LRG Wealth Advisors. I have more than 35 years of experience in the financial services industry, and I help provide investment um, advice and financial advisory services to small business owners, wealthy individuals, and corporate executives. And um, with Mr. Ban today, or I should say with Stephen today, we are going to have an opportunity to, to actually discuss Hightower, what it is. Uh, this gives us a perfect chance to t talk about our firm as a registered investment advisory firm. And so can you tell our audience, Stephen, um, what is, tell us about Hightower and what a, and explain what a registered investment advisory firm is and how it um, differs from the traditional brokerage model that many investors are familiar with. Well, d delighted to. Um, I'll start with what Hightower is. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hightower is a firm that was started in 2008, mm -hmm. um, headquartered in Chicago, which is right. where I live. But um, Hightower has financial advisory firms like LRG all over the United States. I think today we're in 39 different states. Mm -hmm. So I think about Hightower as a network of wealth management firms like yours. Mm -hmm. um, they serve individuals on a local level and try to help them manage not just their investments, but their whole financial picture to try to plan for retirement or what they need within their lives. Um, and what Hightower tries to do is make that easier for them by providing them with a wide variety of different kinds of tools. Clearly, you and your firm know your clients the best. Uh, but our objective as Hightower is to try to help you be even better by giving you access to commentaries on the economy, different kinds of tools, whether it's financial planning or estate planning, uh, to help you all serve your clients better. Yeah, they provide us with an open architecture and platform. And um, so, for example, you're the managing director of Investment Solutions, and the Investment Solutions Group is one of the operational units that helps us do our job. Right. And then we also have trusted custodians such right. as Persian Investments and uh, I think we have Persian Fidelity, TD Bank, and they hold our clients' assets and all the deposits that our clients send in. And, and um, so let's go back to the Investment Solutions Group. Sure. Now you work with Stephanie Link. So I'd like for you to tell us a little about Stephanie and the role she plays and then the role you play in Investment Solutions. Uh, Stephanie is a wonderful person, a dear friend, a fabulous colleague, and in my opinion, truly uh, one of the best investment strategists that's out there uh, talking about Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen her on other television networks, you see her in financial press, um, and, and she plays several roles within Hightower. First and foremost, She's out talking about the firm and trying to reinforce that, uh, uh, that, that Hightower and Hightower's employees and advisors like you and your team know a lot about what's going on out in the markets and the economy. Um, we write commentaries that are available to teams and available to investors. Um, and, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, we actually manage investments in partnership with some of the Hightower teams like mm -hmm. LRG. Mm -hmm. um, in stocks, in bonds, in mutual funds. Um, so this is another example of the kind of tools that we try to work in partnership with, uh, with firms like yours uh, to try to help you serve your clients. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to mention, we were, we were talking about the, um, I wanted to go back to how does the RIA model differ from traditional brokerage okay, um, firms? And, and, and the definition of the RAA model and its contrast is such an important one mm -hmm. for, for people who are looking for wealth managers to understand. Um, so RIA, Registered Investment Advisor, um, is a form of registration under the Securities Exchange Commission. 
And the RIAs are independent of some of the large investment banks. Um, being independent typically affords them the opportunity and in fact the requirement to act as fiduciaries. Well, what does that mean? That means that when you are serving your clients, when I am serving my clients, when anyone within an RIA is serving their clients, they have an affirmative obligation to do only what is in the best interest of the client. And I think that's such a critical distinction um, uh, within this model. And it's why I work in this part of the business. Well, you're exactly right. And that's why I came back to the question because I thought it was critical that we bring out the fact that all of the advisors at High Tower, at RII firms, period, are fiduciaries. And it means that our clients' best interests must always come first and that it's not a nice to do. It is a legal requirement for us. And, and, and as a consequence, the only skin we really have in the game, mm -hmm. we don't have an agenda other than doing what's best for them. Right. Nothing we're trying to sell to them. There's nothing we're trying to do to mm -hmm. or for them. Mm -hmm. It's all about what's in their best interest according to their financial objectives. Okay. So, how, Stephen, how long have you been with um, Hightower? And tell us a little about your, about your specific role. You bet. Um, I've actually only been with Hightower for a little bit mm -hmm. over a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I joined uh, during the pandemic. Uh, one of the fun things about doing things like this is I finally have an opportunity to meet some of my colleagues mm -hmm. like you right, right. in person after right. we've seen each other on Zoom and talked on the phone. Right. Um, I had spent about 20 years in the institutional investment management business, mm -hmm. working for a, a couple of large managers that manage over a trillion dollars for pensions and foundations and endowments and for individuals uh, like the clients of LRG and Hightower. Um, and, and in my role, I, I do a couple of different things. Um, I help with our investment commentaries, which we're going to be talking about in a moment, mm -hmm. talking about what's going on in the markets. Mm -hmm. And it is a rock'em sock'em <laughs> time in the markets right now. Uh, uh, so we publish some of those. Um, I help manage some portfolios, and I work really closely with people like you all mm -hmm. over the country and with their clients all over the country. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, you just mentioned it. Let's get to our questions. We want to look at a mac macroeconomic view of the U.S. economy and the global economy. And let's start out with inflation. In inflation soared in June. Uh, yesterday was reported that the CPI index was up 9.1%. The last time it was up over 9% um, was in November of 1981. So what's going on? Some of us remember those days mm. too. <laughs> I do, yep. Um, inflation is absolutely the elephant in the room right now. And, and it's motivating a tremendous amount of what I think we're gonna see over the next six, 12, 18, 24 months, maybe longer. Um, I hope we don't end up in the kind of situation that we did in the 70s, where we sort of stumbled along for a very long time. But what's going on with inflation? It's kind of a perfect storm for inflation right now. And this all goes back to the pandemic, really. Um, so we found ourselves in a shutdown mode, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Manufacturing slowed, and in some cases stopped. Well, this gets back to basic economics 101, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say that when there's less supply and consistent demand, prices are gonna go up. But it gets even worse mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because for very good reasons, uh, the Federal Reserve that kind of sets interest rates um, and the federal government put in policies that were stimulative, mm -hmm. that were meant to help the economy keep going. Because when the government shut down, yeah. the economy slowed down dramatically. So we, we gave direct financial aid to individuals and to businesses. And interest rates were cut to historically low levels. Well, that was meant to stimulate demand. Right. So now we have more demand and less supply. Well, that once again is going to make prices go up. Let's talk about some of the causes of that. Mm -hmm. Semiconductor manufacturing yeah. slowed down. Yeah. And semiconductors are used in pretty much everything we can think about. Yeah. Um, so the availability of computers, automobiles, That's right. appliances was all cut back. Right, the whole supply chain 
continuum. Let's, let's cut back. Well, right. And, and the supply chain has even another level to it mm -hmm. because with the lack of people able to work or willing to work, shipments coming in from outside the United States of all kinds of goods, whether raw materials or finished goods, slowed. Mm -hmm. You may recall the photographs yeah. of these uh, cargo ships sitting outside the port of Los Angeles with no one to unload them. Yeah. Um, so we had the supply chain challenges. Um, one of the big contributors uh, that's going on right now to inflation is housing mm -hmm. and the cost of housing and the cost of rents, which tend to lag the cost of housing by about a year. Uh, but for at least the last decade, the United States has collectively underinvested in new houses. So not enough houses, the population grows, more people trying to go there, housing prices go up, mm -hmm. now rents are starting to go up. Mm -hmm. And then the other big one is oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to get to oil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, oil, oil and gas prices. The energy index is up 41.6% year to date. That's the largest 12 month increase since April of 1980. Mm -hmm. There's a theme here, 1980. <laughs> and energy would include fuel, oil, gasoline, electricity. So, what's driving the rise in oil and gas prices? Here again, a little bit of a perfect storm, mm -hmm. um, but exacerbated by the conflict in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So let's start with, and we've known this all the time, we've known that oil is a finite resource. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and, and then we're seeing a global movement to pay attention to climate change, to pay attention to emissions um, that are taxing oil, taxing carbon. And uh, in the United States and elsewhere, there has been a push to reduce production. Yeah, things like the pipeline uh, that were canceled to reduce production. So, Stephen, I'm going to ask you to hold your thought there sure. for one moment. We're going to take a quick 60 second break and we'll come right back and resume with our conversation about the pipeline. We'll be right back on Money Thoughts. <music> Welcome back to Money Thoughts. We are having an engaging conversation with Mr. Stephen P. Ban. He is the Managing Director of Investment Solutions at Hightower. And Stephen, we are into our, our conversation. We were discussing oil and gas prices, and you were just starting to explain what is driving up the rise in oil and gas prices. So can you continue from there, please? It, absolutely. And by the way, we were just talking on the break about how much fun this is. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being here. The, the oil and gas thing is another classic supply and demand challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Oil supplies over time have been contracting uh, in the United States. In Europe, OPEC has contracted uh, uh, production or has had it grow more slowly than demand. Mm -hmm. And then we have a shock. And the shock was uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the, the consequent uh, sanctions that were put in place, which put about a five uh, billion million, I'm sorry, a barrel a day mm -hmm. dent uh, in, in the availability of oil. Mm -hmm. So here again, we have a, a, um, a supply shock to the downside and demand continues to grow, right? The world needs more energy. Uh, whether it's to operate technology or we're seeing developing countries uh, begin to have things like air conditioning and more automobiles. Yeah, yeah. So demand for oil goes up. And the upshot of this is that we now, we saw oil up over $130 a barrel. It's come back under 100 right now. Right. Um, gasoline, but a year ago, what was it, 65? I mean, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and gasoline prices have soared to levels that we've never seen before. Now again, gas has come back in about 40 cents a gallon um, as of when we're talking today, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still at historically high levels. And people need to travel, people need to heat. I read an article this morning that said uh, heating oil, and here in the Northeast, there's a lot of heating oil that's in use, up 98% wow. year over year. Yeah. So that's another that's big contributor to inflation. Yeah. Well, it is unsustainable. And Janet Yellen, mm -hmm. former head of the Federal Reserve and now the Secretary of the Treasury, said this morning, mm -hmm. after the Fed for such a long time had been talking about inflation as transitory, mm -hmm. she finally said, this is unsustainably high. And I think that's something that consumers, as we all are, have known for a while. 
Um, and that gets to probably what we should talk about next, which is what are we going to do about it? Well, that's what I was going <laughs> to ask you. What is, um, well, let's bring in one more thing, and then, then I'll ask you, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> Consumer spending. The food index is up 10.4% from this time last year. This is the largest 12-month increase, again, that we've seen in food, food prices since February 1981. <laughs> so it's definitely um, a, st a theme here of this return to the 80s. This isn't, this isn't um, a good thing, <laughs> but can you explain to us why is there such a strong focus on consumer spending and the strength of the economy? I was a carefree college student in the <laughs> early 80s, and there are some times when I'd like to return to that. Uh, the consumer accounts for about 70% mm -hmm. of the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. So we always pay close attention to how healthy the consumer is. Mm -hmm. And I go back to through the course of the early part of the pandemic, people were receiving stimulus checks. They weren't spending as much. Consumer savings went way up. Um, and since the reopening has been gradually happening, we talk about the reopening as though it's an event and it's really a process and it comes and goes. And we have a new variant that people are worried about now and we're hoping that that doesn't become a, a big obstacle to economic growth. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the consumer is a really critical part of it. So as the reopen happened, consumers bought more stuff and they bought more services. Go to an airport and look at what the lines look like. Try to get a hotel room. Try to buy an airline ticket. It's unbelievable. Right, because demand is way up and supply still hasn't come back together because of the labor shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the consumer is so critical. Now, what we're starting to see right now is that consumer confidence is beginning to fall. Mm -hmm. So it's under 100, um, and, and 100 is sort of the right. average level over time. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing that because prices are up, even though wages are up, prices are up more than wages, which means what we call real wages are down. The real buying power of a dollar right. is coming down. Our real purchasing power. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. I mean, if something costs a dollar ten that used to cost a dollar, and our wages are only up to a dollar five, mm -hmm. well, then our wages don't go as far. So our real purchasing power is down. Mm -hmm. um, and and what's coming out of that with inflation is that savings is is coming out of the system. So the consumer has been very strong, and consumer spending remains strong, but a number of us are looking to, to believe that it's going to slow, that people are going to start putting off discretionary purchases like cars, mm -hmm. like appliances, mm -hmm. um, like vacations. Uh, so we'll keep a close eye on the consumer uh, because it's a pretty good bellwether for what's going on in the economy more broadly. So hasn't that shift kind of taken place when we look at maybe the recommendations that we're making for investments? So I know near the end of last year, we saw a shift take place from uh, consumer um, discretionary stocks over to dis consumer, uh, I want to say value, but I want to say cons cons uh, staples. Staples. Right, right. So discretionary means you can go out and buy a car. Staples means you have to buy food and whatever you need from Home Depot. So, right. um, and then that means there's a shift in growth stocks to value stocks. So explain how that kind of happens within this discussion. Sure. Well, I, I think you did a really nice job of mm -hmm. just talking about uh, um, how consumer behavior shifts. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things about talking about the economy and talking about investing is we all see every day mm -hmm. in our own behavior and the behavior of people around us what's driving things. So you're mm -hmm. exactly right. Mm -hmm. I may need to put off my purchase of a car, mm -hmm. right? But I need to feed my family. Right. Um, I've got two teenage boys at home, and I assure you, I need to feed them a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I need health care. Mm -hmm. I need my prescriptions. Right. I need housing. Right. Um, so uh, there is often a shift during a time like this from people looking at the growth of discretionary companies and, and, and uh, 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 the growth of some of the big tech companies, we'll talk about that yeah, in a second, yeah. um, to things that are, are just what we need on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So, Stephen, you, to your point, what do we do about this? What is Hightower recommending when we talk about soaring oil and gas prices, consumer spending, uh, inflation, and we haven't even mentioned the Federal Reserve yet. So, what is 
the outlook for the economy, for the U.S., the global economy? What is Sitar saying about all of these things? There's a famous set of books called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on the cover of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, two words appear, don't panic, mm -hmm. which is really difficult to do when the markets are down more than 20%, when interest rates are starting to go up, when prices are starting to go up. Historically, though, if investors have been able to weather the storm and, and, and stand pat, um, they've tended to do pretty well. One of the things that, that I love to quote, and it's scarcely my own idea, but when most things go on sale, mm -hmm. people buy them. Right. When stocks and bonds go on sale, People panic. <laughs> People panic and they sell them. Right? They sell them. Our objective w with all of our clients is to try to help them buy low and sell high. And when markets get like this and people start to get appropriately nervous, especially mm -hmm. if they're closer to retirement mm -hmm. or, or especially if they're relying on their immediate investments to, to pay current bills, yeah. um, they sometimes want to cut their losses. And it depends on an individual basis what the best advice is going to be. Uh, but if you look historically, staying invested, and if you have what we call dry powder cash available, buying things when they're on sale can be a very successful strategy. But the critical thing is, and it sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm hawking your business, but this happens to have the ancillary benefit of being the truth. Mm -hmm. The most important thing everybody can do during a period of time like this is to talk to their financial advisor mm -hmm. and, and, and reevaluate the situation uh, there's a, a study called behavioral economics, yeah. and be, one of my favorite takeaways from behavioral economics mm -hmm. is you can make better financial decisions for me mm -hmm. than I can make for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you can be more dispassionate about it, you can be more objective, um, and I get emotional. We're, we're covering so many <laughs> things this morning, but we have about three minutes left, and I want to um, give you an opportunity, if you'd like to, to let uh, anyone know how to contact you if the, you want them to contact you directly for any reason. I, they already have my contact details. Um, but as we begin to tie all of um, this conversation together, let's talk about the Federal Reserve. So um, the Federal Reserve manages a very important um, element of the economy, which is the Fed funds rate. Right. So can you define um, what the Fed funds rate is and how can our government or how can the Fed keep us into, from going into a recession? Or are we already in a, <laughs> in, and if we are already in a recession, how can they create what they would call, quote unquote, a soft landing? Right, mm -hmm. so the federal funds rate <clears throat> is the rate at which the Federal Reserve, the United States Central Bank, mm -hmm. lends money to banks overnight. Right. Now, that rate right now is still lower than, than what they would call a neutral rate. This goes back to the great financial crisis and what went on through COVID. So uh, it, it's still lower than it's been historically. They raised the rate uh, 75 basis points last month. Based on the data that just come out on the CPI and the producer price index, um, some people are betting there's an 87% chance priced into the market that they will move 100 basis points, which I don't believe they've ever done before. Mm -hmm. But the point is when they raise this rate, other interest rates go up. When interest rates go up, economies tend to slow because people can't borrow as much, businesses can't borrow as much, um, so they spend less. Uh, the Fed's challenge here is to take rates up in a fashion that slows the economy without totally tanking the economy. And I think their objective has been to reduce the number of job openings massively larger than the number of people who are unemployed mm -hmm. without reducing the number of jobs. Now you said something really interesting and we'll see data on this shortly. Mm -hmm. Are we already in a recession? Mm -hmm. and, and I guess we'll find out what the numbers say, but every one of us can see from how we behave and what we see around us um, and make our own bets on that. But uh, I think that the broadly held point of view is uh, that, that there will be a recession. We hope it's a minor one. And ironically, mm -hmm. with the Federal Reserve raising rates right now to try to slow the economy, what do they do when there's a recession? They cut them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a great place to end and we can resume another time. But Stephen Bannon has been 
a delight to have you here. I can't believe we're almost out of time. Would you like to say how anyone can contact you in the next few seconds we have? Absolutely. I'd be welcome to get me through Hightower. Probably the best thing to do is to get me through Deborah. Okay. But it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat. Nice for you to be here. Thank you, Steve.